starting. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. Today I am with Tony Lutzak, who is in Starkville, Mississippi. Say hi, Tony. Hey guys, how's it going? And today uh, we're going to be talking about kind of the state of the golf industry, state of golf instruction a little bit, but mostly just golf in general. Uh, this is a live broadcast, so we're going we're gonna to let some people come in, but mainly we're shooting this to live in uh, perpetuity on, on the channel. So uh, <laughs> it's not one of those live videos that's only worthwhile if you're watching live. I think th be, this will be fun to watch for a long time to come. All right, so um, Tony, uh, tell me a little bit about the recent article. Uh, oh, 13 viewers. All right, we got people in. So okay. Tony, tell me a little bit about the recent article that you read about um, the state of golf business and uh, Americans interaction with golf. So I would say two, are two things. The National Golf Foundation came out with some of the new reports from 16 and such. And then, then kind of Wall Street, I think it was Wall Street Journal. I'd have to, I, I would need to go back and actually verify that. But talking about how much money uh, the associations have put into golf with really the programs, unfortunately, aren't working. And that, now, it's not necessarily their fault. But, yeah, so we had – you know, the, the article in the National Golf Foundation stated that there was 2 million golfers that have left after, from the last five years. You know, and then the mm -hmm. USGA supposedly, and this shocked me, and that's the reason why I, I want to verify this article, but they talked about spending a, a billion dollars over the last, uh, you know, decade on programs. And then when you not knowing exactly what the PGA Tour spent and the PGA of America spent, but now all of a sudden you got – all these institutions spending a lot of money and the numbers are still going down. So, you know, being a, I'm still paying my dues. I'm retired from the PGA as, as I get my PhD, but there's a lot of money being spent, which is really just being wasted. Unfortunately, that maybe if utilized differently could help grow the game. And unfortunately it just seems like it's just money going out to the marketing firms and consulting firms and, everything else and, and nothing's nothing's improving okay so we want to hear your guys ideas about one do you agree with the results of the study do you agree agree that golf is just uh bleeding really hemorrhaging uh golfers in the last five years and two we'd like to hear some uh constructive solutions to what you would do differently um we know i know that from a television you know i work in tv and from a television uh standpoint the USGA and also a lot of the big tournaments, but the USGA certainly uh, specifically got a huge windfall from Fox. Uh, I don't want to put a number on it, but I think it was in the in, over a billion dollars, I think, uh, to, to be able, I think they got a 20 year, they bought out NBC for the rights to basically not only the US Open, but the US Women's Open, the US Senior Open, the mid amateur, the amateur, and also the uh, the team event amateur and the Walker Cup, all basically anything that happens, any USGA event, they're putting it on. And uh, I gotta, um, I gotta, you know, congratulate Fox because I think their 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 U.S. Open broadcast is just as good as the NBC one, especially in their second year. But if you watch like the mid amateur and uh, some of these, you know really rarely seen events um they're they're broadcast to just a uh, just as high a standard it really looks really cool to see these uh mid amateurs and also like you know guys like nathan smith and and uh you know regular people for the most part um golfing in in a way that's like totally full production so i know that the usga got this huge windfall of money from that and a lot of that is going into these programs so um Tony, so from uh, your point of view, why do you think in the last five years, let's just, take it, let's just take it as if it's true, because it probably is. Why do you think in the last five years, millions of golfers have, uh, have stopped golfing? I, I, I think, you know, I, and I asked some people on this, because after posting, I said, you know, I wonder if this is really true. And I've asked, and time has always been uh, one of those factors. We did not have enough time. Um, I think culturally, relationships 
have changed, meaning th there's the weekends become more of time together with the family and different things like that, where before, you know, husband usually ran out to the club or whatever, then maybe the family joined him later on. So I think families have be gotten um, much stronger. You know, there's time spent. I think the kids are playing different sports and maybe they're heading off to this event. You know, there's a lot, parents spend a, a, a good bit of money on their kids' sporting activities and they, and they travel. I mean, I got parents that play, they have their kids playing baseball and they're traveling like nine months, pretty much three weekends out of each month in tournaments for baseball tournaments. So I think when you just, maybe the cost, um, you know, you don't have the appeal that Tiger Woods has had on the economy. I remember when I was in New York City running inner city junior golf programs and that was at the, the peak of Tiger Woods. Um, you know, everybody knew Tiger Woods but, and they may not have played golf, but maybe there was an interest there. Now they don't have that person that they can identify with. So it's like, eh, you know, it's, it's not, it, it just, it's just, it's not important anymore. So I think there's not just one thing. I think um, golfers aren't getting any better is one, the time comp component families, the version of a family has changed. The roles have changed. Um, so when you kind of put everything together, it's kind of then boils up into saying, you know, eh, golf is fun once in a while. And I think that's it. I mean, the USGA or the, National Golf Foundation and them are starting to consider counting recreational like top golf and different things like that as rounds of golf or participants in golf just to make the numbers look better. And I think that's a, that's a mistake because actually the National Golf Foundation kind of created a big problem themselves when they said there was never enough. We could build a golf course a day for how many years? and we would not catch up with the demand. So they created this false sense of demand, and now the economy is, is, is just equalizing itself out, I believe. Okay, well, let's go from like a, a top-down approach uh, as far as, because the disconnect, I mean, with the, uh, the world economy and stuff is that purses have never been higher. Uh, golfers have never been, you know, the top, go the most, you know, the, the, if it's golf is a pyramid, we're talking about the guys at the very, very tip of the pyramid. They have never been making more money and, and uh, more power to them. They should they should get they should probably be making even more for what they bring in, but it is not it is not filtering down. And um, when there was like when you, the the time that you were talking about when you were in New York, uh, teaching people, I know that at that same time here in Long Beach, uh, at the golf course near me, you literally had to sleep in your car the night before. At, to play recreation park, wow! You know, not a not you know just like a muni. Uh, that was uh, people. I wasn't here then, but people told me that in order to get a tea time, then uh, somebody from the five some would have to sleep. So every five weeks, somebody different would be the odd man out to have to sleep in their car. That was just how intense golf was out there. Now it's really regional because out here it's still it's still packed everywhere you go, but um. But as I've traveled around the country interviewing people, yeah, you notice that it's not, it's different. It's, it, there's just less bodies at the golf course. But one thing that, that, one, uh, that a lot of people have said is now, okay, people have left golf, but is that a problem? You know, does that even matter? Or should, is golf really returning to the mean of, yeah, this is a game for, um, for a very specific type of person at a very specific time in their life, or is this a game that should, that is even worthwhile for more people to be trying to pick up? You know, a lot of people have said, well, yeah, I want less golfers. So then there's less people to annoy me or whatever it is. What do you think about that? <laughs> um, I, I, th I think there's some, some good truth to that because I, I believe that, you know, it's not so much whether there's enough room on golf courses. I think there always is, but I think, you know, a lot of people were raised up in the game. Their parents played or maybe they're members of the club or they caddied or whatever. Those days are all gone. There's no caddies really anymore. Um, so I, 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 I agree that, you know what, it's okay to kind of flatten this out. Let's get everything cleaned up. We, we built too many golf courses. 
Um, you know, there, there's 19 PGM programs on an you know, I mean, everything became so big and let's go fast, fast, fast that no one really thought about what would happen when the, the customers stopped showing up. Mm -hmm. And so that, I, to me, this is just cyclical. I think this is just a regular business going through its cycles and, and it takes a while because uh, for it to kind of flatten out. So to me, this doesn't surprise me. I think it's okay. Yeah, we have 13 days, I think 12 days until uh, Tiger Woods will be seen again. Who knows for how long, but he will be seen again at some kind of a competitive golf tournament in the Bahamas. Uh, personally, I'm, I've been through so many Tiger Woods comebacks that I, I don't, I'm not really expecting anything more than uh, an exhibition kind of showing. But um, uh, so really, we, we're beyond the point of waiting for Tiger star to shine again and, and getting people super hyped up on golf and having that turn into, into people on the golf course. But uh, now, Tony, let's talk a little bit. Okay, so, th so they did spend billions of dollars. I know that the PGA Tour operates as a charity, and every single tournament operates as an, its own independent charity. And the amount of money that the PGA Tour raises for charity um, blows away every other uh, sports organization in the world. Yep. It's, uh, it's really amazing, and they do a lot of great things. Uh, but there ha it has been uh, criticized as well, um, I think unfairly, but it has been criticized. Like on Deadspin, they had an article about where the money's going and stuff. One thing that when I was thinking about this problem, and I was thinking about, okay, where does a lot of the money go? I think a lot of the focus has been misdirected because whenever you see a grow the game campaign, and this might be controversial, but whenever you see a grow the game campaign, who are they marketing to? They're always marketing to little kids, like uh, to get real little kids into golf. They're marketing to women to get women into golf. You know, for um, the last 25 years, we've heard, you know, the women are coming, you know, women are going to start joining golf in droves, you know. So they're marketing to, to little kids, to women, and really that's about it. I mean, I mean, those are the, the two major things. When I, when I watch the U.S. Open and I see like, hey, let's go golf, you know, who do you see in those commercials? It's, right. But I, I really think who they should be marketing to is they should look at the demographic of Be Better Golf, you know, which is 91% which is men. And it's, it's ages basically from my age till, till 90, you know. Right. So like I'd be at the young, you know, it's, it is some, a lot of high school kids that, that get into it, but, um, especially on YouTube, but, uh, but really I think the, so basically people, a lot of people, some people play golf when they're young and then they never, they don't play golf again during college or even in high school, they might not play golf during college. And then they get extremely busy with their family life. And then they come back to golf around like when things start to chill out, like in their late forties and then they get like intensely into it around i saw i heard some statistic that that like half of golf lessons are taken by people between the ages of like 48 and 60. it's like everybody in that coming up on retirement age is like amped up to get better then and uh so i really think the marketing should should and and the classes and the uh grow the game effort should be really directed at like at the guys in that late 40s I they should be like doing a, doing a laser like focus on that to make it extremely attractive uh initially affordable like i think the the entry barrier like to to play like simple golf should be really affordable but then the high end should go as expensive as people want to so what do you think about as far as the target marketing of of how this billion dollars has been basically um set on fire i, I would i would have to agree with you i i, I believe that and, and I brought this up in, in, in a national, I think, teaching and coaching summit Q&A. We had an opportunity. So, and I, I personally, when, when I was running the golf course, uh, PGA at the time was giving money to the sections to do Play Golf America campaigns. So it was down to the section and to the local level. We had 250 to 300 people show up, from my memory, on that particular day. Okay, so we had, we had bouncy bounces for the kids. We had the driving range. We had free lessons, demo equipment, you know, just exposing. Them. So here in Starkville, Mississippi, with, with take away the students, and we got a population base of about 25,000. So 
So for us to have 250, 300 people that were new people to the facility, you know, I'd say at least probably three quarters of them were new. That was great. But guess what? That got taken away from us because the PGA wanted to do their own program. So again, it, to me, and I brought this up saying big government doesn't work. I'm not going to get into the Republican Democrat, but I'm just saying big government, when you dictate to everybody what they have to fit into, it doesn't work. Your region's different than the region here in Mississippi. Yeah. The offers are different, you know, uh, go to Michigan or Florida, whatever. You have different demographics. So why not take that money and get it to the local level? No, you got people making a single decision. Let's just paint brush the whole, pro the whole country. And this is what everybody needs to do. And it just, it's the wrong way of doing it. I, I just, it's wasting money, unfortunately. I also believe in your, what you're saying is let's take care of the customer that is already out there. Let's make their experience better. You know, uh, and this is going to give me a lot of flat, give me a lot of trouble, but this, I truly believe this. When it, especially from the instruction side, you got people giving golf lessons that have a business degree. I came out of PGM program with a marketing degree. What does that tell me about how motor skills are developed or how cognitive functions work? So we're, we're also kind of generating these golf pros that really don't understand how to, to do run a, a personal coaching business is really what golf should be designed as. So I think, again, we just keep missing the boat on what should be done and, and just throw a bunch of money into it and hopefully it'll get better. And if it does get a little bit better, hey, we're, look at how well the money is being used. I just think that everything's being missed. Yeah, okay, let's go into the uh, uh, viewer questions, or <laughs> viewer solutions, really. Uh, Be Better Golfers are really about the most uh, dedicated yeah. golfers there, there are. So, um, yeah, people are agreeing in, in, in – uh, and also in Mississippi, but a lot closer to Louisiana, plays at a semi-private club, and he always has the place entirely to himself when he goes in the afternoon. And I know a lot of courses has... All right, the game grew, Vicky says, the game grew as, a middle, as the middle class grew. The game's decline mirrors hollowing out of the middle class over the last <laughs> 15 years. So uh, we're getting political, obviously. Uh, but yeah, there's some truth to that. I know that... Um, a very, very famous instructor uh, said to me that will remain nameless, but uh, everyone on this channel would know the name, said to me that, um, said to me that Mark McCormick, Gary Player, Arnold Palmer, and uh, Jack Nicholas ruined the game of golf. And I was like, how? And, because, and he said, because it's at that point when it started, um, when the big money with equipment and everything started coming in and advertising and everything started coming in, that's also when uh, the equipment changed. And so, uh, Tony, how do you think that this problem, do you think it's connected at all to the golf ball? Because a lot of people think as the golf ball has gotten uh, a lot further and gone much further even for regular players, do you think it has any, anything to do with it? Well, of course. I mean, but I think that's a, that's a tour problem. Yeah. That's an average golfer problem. You know, the, the golf courses are actually too long for most people. You know, so I think golf well, the golf ball go a little bit further for regular golfers is great. You know, I actually like the idea when, when Arnold Palmer was promoting with Callaway that illegal driver. I love that idea because, you know, again, it was – it was, there should be separate rules for the tour players versus the regular golfer. Regular golfers generally don't play by the rules anyhow. They have their own version of how they play their games. And I think that's fine. Yes, there needs to be the USGA to run their tournaments and organize everything. But, you know, they're realizing that they have to change that. So I don't think it's the golf ball's fault on regular golfers. I think that's a tour issue. You know, why does the Major League Baseball not use aluminum bats? Yeah, I mean, that would, uh, yeah, that would, they would have to, it would have to be um, probably twice as big to, I, I know that Barry Bonds, a, a funny story, I went to the, the All-Star game when I was young and Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire were just having fun 
uh, with aluminum bats doing a warm up like before the All Star game, and they were hitting it out of Veterans Stadium, oh, which wow. was almost impossible. Like not out of it, but they were like, you know, all the way to the very top. It was ridiculous. So it was. Uh, but yeah, I mean, certainly, uh, I think the one thing I can say about the golf ball going further for regular golfers, because I've I've seen this when I play with guys. If this is the fairway, right? And yep. you, you usually hit your drive, let's say, 195 yards, right? If yep. you just hit it offline, then you're in the left rough. But if you have a, a ball that goes really far, now you're ju- you've hit it like maybe 45 yards further, but you're just deeper into the trees now. So I think, yeah. I think there's a lot to that, especially off the tee, guys um, just struggling right off the bat. Well, there's two little backspin. So from a from a fitting standpoint, obviously, I bought you know TaylorMade was promoting the seventeen seventeen hundred, but the problem with that and making the golf balls less spinny and then you know off the driver and then have the drivers with the low spin is you're right when you get it going sideways, that ball is moving quicky quicker sideways. Backspin. So the more backspin we put on a ball, the straighter the ball flight. So those old baladas that used to kind of just float up that looked, exactly looked real cool, um, those days are gone now. Now the game is actually played this way. So it's a totally different type of ball flight. So I, I agree with you on that. Okay, uh, we're going to go to your guys' comments about how to uh, draw people back to, to golf or whether or not uh, that is even an issue that should be happening. We wanted to, <laughs> t- t- Tony and I wanted to let you guys know that on coming up in exactly one month, we have a really special event for a very, very few amount of Be Better golfers. Tony and I are going to be at Royal Links in Las Vegas, Nevada, on uh, December 16th and 17th. We're going to be doing a Be Better Golf. Like basically, Tony, it's going to be really focused on power and the driver. Yeah, that's going to be the big focus. And, and what I want to do is, as in working with some of the strength conditioning coaches on our, on our sensor project, we're really just kind of diving into what creates how, and, and this is kind of the essence of what's going to come out of it. It's how you properly load, how you properly explode, and then properly drive. And that actually, that lead acronym is really applicable to the golf swing. And it's something that, you know, we talked about winding up in the back swing, but really that, doesn't really give us tell us how to properly load up into the backswing so it's just a better way of doing it we're gonna get into that it's the same stuff that i've been working on with 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 everybody but we've just gone a little bit further in the research to get more in depth on how to load up the muscles which muscles to load up how to accelerate the club head effortlessly and then what is the function of the body and function of the pelvis which is more of a driving aspect so this is going to be bringing in some uh additional research for the school. Yeah, we have some, uh, a really awesome facility at Royal Links, which is basically, uh, they, they made recreations of all the best holes of the Open Championship and uh, put them in the middle of the desert. But it, they, somehow they really make it work. It's really cool. I played a really good front nine there and a really terrible front nine there the one time I played there. But um, it's really nice. It's, it's, uh, it's gonna be very exciting. If you guys are interested, email contact be better golf at gmail.com. There's very few spots. So let's get to your guys' questions. And that'll be, uh, yeah, December. Looking at it now, December 16th and 17th. So it's going to be a two-day school, but I think we're going to make a one-day option available. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So the, um, let's go in here. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they have to say. All right. So they say, all right, um, Mr. Kipling agrees that with the demographic, they should aim at middle-aged men, more specifically businessmen. Fill the courses up during the week and leave the weekends free for guys who can't get the time off. Um, certainly, I know that here in Long... I, I think a really good idea that they've started here in Long Beach is to change, I think, the business model for a lot of things. If you look at... a Netflix and Amazon and a lot of the more uh, modern business plans is less like pay per, you know, pay for pay per interaction and more on a subscription basis. So, uh, you know, I I think uh, here in Long Beach, you can be a member of the Players Club. So whether you go or not, you're paying like $40 a month. 
but that gives you exclusive discounts and it gives you uh, range balls free for the rest of the month. And it just motivates, if you have it already and you're paying for it already, you find yourself going to the golf course more often just to make it more worth your dollar. Right. I think that's a, that's a great idea. And, and re really, I think a lot of this comment, one of the things that changed legally is a lot of the, the tax incentives for corporations and especially in the financial industry, they used to be able to have programs out at the golf course, maybe throw in nine holes and it was to build clientele and different things like that. All those expenses got pulled away. And so now they can't use golf as a vehicle to bring in new clients. So all those weekday golf, that got totally disbanded. So they had to bring in, it was more of an education. Now they maybe do lunches and different things like that. So unfortunately, some of the, the tax laws has, has also had a negative effect on, on golf during the week. Okay. Uh, all right. Essentially, the manufacturers made it easier to play, made clubs super hot off the face, and now I think we are at the pinnacle of technology. Tony, do you think that, that golf technology can be improved from where it is, or is it everything from this point just aesthetic differences? Well, you know, the USGA's built the wall. You know, the golf ball can only come off so fast, club heads a certain size, blah, 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 the coefficient of restitution, the whole thing. Um, so I don't think the – I think the equipment could get better, but the USGA is not going to allow it. So I, I really don't see, um, you know, I think that's the reason why you see Nike kind of getting out of it for multiple reasons. Bridgestone's not going to the PGA show, I've heard. Um, you know, I, I just, I think golf, you know, is a commodity. I think golf equipment is now a commodity. Um, I think the better engineering companies will be the ones that really withstand it. Um, you know, Ping, I know, does phenomenal. Their, their engineers and their whole facility uh, is very much hands-on. Uh, I remember going through their facility and was totally impressed how even though golf had grown and was subsiding, you know, they didn't lose employees. Now, there's some other facilities just down the road, or obviously not down the road from Ping, but the next state over there in California, in Carlsbad, and, you know, they were letting people off. They were trying to use different technology, reduce costs. So I just think that uh, we're kind of painting different colors right now on equipment, and it's a commodity. There's nothing unique. So let's go to your area of, of particular expertise, Tony. So, so I, I know, especially in, the, in this last, you know, two years of doing Be Better Golf, Golf, just to put it real simply, golf is much more fun when you're good at it. Yes. And golf is much, much more fun when you have a general idea of where the ball is going to go. Uh, when, you're, when you're just going out there and hoping for those two to five, you know, decent shots around, you know, the ones that keep you coming back, yeah. that is just a drag. And it gets old. It gets old real quick, like um, being bad, especially – you know, I, the strange thing about golf that somebody was saying, you know, about somebody put up some kind of tweet. I thought you were involved in it. And they said something about um, uh, something about like, you know, the, the need to be like a great athlete in golf and everything. But I see so many great athletes that are that are great basketball players, baseball players, football players, tennis and they come over to golf and it's like they've entered a new planet and all of a sudden they've been athletic their whole life and now they're terrible at golf. Where do, what is the, the component of golf instruction and how can we make people have more fun just by like, because if, if you always see yourself getting a little bit better, you're going to keep coming back. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with you uh, that there is a, a situation with golf instruction and, and I guess – I'm, I'm, I'm starting to now get comfortable with saying, hey, guys, it's not working. Girls, it's not working. We, we can't go about it. When we take a look at athletic sports, throwing a baseball overhand, throwing a football, batting, all those things have different alignments to whatever object they're doing. Okay, so throwing a ball, ball's up over here. Okay, well, I'm swinging a golf club. Golf club is I'm swinging it below me or below my waist. So we can't apply those athleticisms 
to the golf swing. Those, those timing mechanisms are not the same. And so what ends up happening is the athlete jumps in there, thinks they can do exactly what they want to do, baseball and softball and everything else, and away we go, and they can't hit the ball. They can't control because that technique is not applicable. So, and unfortunately, what has, what's probably one thing that everybody can do right now? They can videotape their own golf swings. Okay, so now everyone can become an instructor, and now they can see their swing. But how we work cognitively and how we control our movement cannot be seen by a camera. And that's one thing that's missing in most golf instruction. They're trying to say, hey, hit this position, hit this alignment. You know, we got 5,000 frames per second camera and see, you want to be right here at impact. But that's not how we work. And when we apply a kinematic approach to golf instruction, golfers will get worse. Yeah, like when you try to use a, a slow-mo mentality in a real-time situation, uh, what happens? Uh, disaster. <laughs> right. Yeah, golf swing's a ballistic motion. So that motor program has to be pre-programmed prior to any movement. So when we try to hit these positions, it just and stop. And I see so many people are saying, well, how, where do I need to be on the way down? What do I need to be doing? It's like, man, you got 250 milliseconds to, to make the downswing. Mm -hmm. You don't have time to have all these thoughts. Because based on how much time it takes for us to feel something, think about it, and then do something, the downswing is practically over. That's about 180 milliseconds plus minus for, for different individuals for us to process and do something with this information. We don't have it. If how we start it, we can control that. And then that gets into this whole big argument. Um, you know, and, and the thing that's frustrating with instruction is, and, you know, thanks, I will say thanks to you and, and what you've done is helped Reactionary Golf come up and have a platform from golfers from around the world that I'm hearing this story that they've taken lessons for 20 years and have gotten worse and just quit the game. And then because they saw me on your channel and stuff like this, they try it out and they're actually enjoying it and playing the best golf of their life. Now, every instructor can say that. And I think the role of an instructor is a coach. It's about relationship. It's not always about the information. But when poor information is given, the person's trying and implementing this information, they may be implementing that information perfectly, but they're not getting any better. So is it the person's fault or the information? Well, it's the information, it's the program, you know, but people now are charging big bucks per hour to give golf lessons and it's, you know, people just aren't getting any better. Yeah. When you, t when you talk about, so, so when you, when you're talking about um, trying to hit positions and stuff, so is it more, you have to, uh, you have to reverse engineer it so that like, you might have to try things that, that, totally don't look like they're happening at all in pictures to, to make it rather than make, make the action fit the picture. You have to, to do weird things. I, I, I think you understand what I'm saying. I did it out more clearly because I, it's okay. uh, and that's basically what I've done is re reverse engineered the whole process. So it actually, I wouldn't say it started, but one of the pieces to it is I went to Callaway and said, okay, when I was out there, I talked with the guy running the robot. And I said, what are the parameters of the club head coming into the ball in order to make the ball go straight every time? And they said, well, even with the robot, there's variability. So we get mad at ourselves because we're not perfect. So we should, we should stop doing that. But he said within plus or minus three degrees is where we want the path. And obviously that face has to be perpendicular or what is normal to that path um, in order to make the ball go straight. So what I did using the foresight device is figured out what does three degrees inside out outside in what does that look like in the swing you know making sure the cameras are placed correctly and everything else so then i just kind of went backwards and said okay how's the body designed how's the, you know looked at people's research well what part moves this do the wrist hinge or do they do they you know are more of an extension flexion type motion so by reverse engineering how the golf club is designed to produce a straight shot how the body is designed to move that's how reactionary golf came up. And that's the reason why like, when we talk about how important the arms are in the swing, 
And, and I may say to somebody, we talked about with you, your golf swing, hey, let's get those arms moving faster. And the initial reaction is, well, I've already always been told I use my hands and arms too much. I need to become more of a body player. And it's like, no, 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 no. Say we, that's just a misinterpretation of what people feel. So because of all these factors of how we learn, how we move, and because of the time aspect, there's no way we can get into position golf. Backswing a little bit to feel some of learning, but the better we get with things, then we have to stop thinking completely and just perform. We're going to get more into Tony's uh, philosophy about golf and uh, load, explode, and drive on another one of these in, uh, in a week. But uh, so have your questions. For, we'll do another live broadcast. Have your questions ready for that. Um, I wanted to let you guys know that uh, just tuned in or have been watching this long uh, on one of the reasons we're doing this. On uh, December 16th and 17th in Las Vegas, we're having a very small, very small, like only a few golfers each day. Uh, uh, be Better Golf School, Reactionary Golf School combo. Uh, Tony and I will be there uh, helping you guys out. Tony will be there with his uh, technology and everything. And we're going to be really concentrating on getting more distance. And one thing that Tony always talks about, dead straight golf shots. Talk about that, Tony. Well, and that gets in the reverse engineer. So we know what straight is. We know how the club is designed to hit the ball straight. And obviously the shortest distance between us and the hole is in a straight line. Now, and the good thing is, is once you learn that straight swing, then you can create all different sorts of shots. So the idea is you don't have to have 13 different golf swings or more to create shots. It's one swing, one one approach that you can develop. And then just with tweaks of grip, club face, you can hit the ball any direction, height, low, right to left, left to right, you want. So we just learn how to hit the ball straight, which then gives us better contact. We know where the ball's going and it makes the game a lot easier. Cool. Okay, one comment came through. I, th I think you would like <laughs> this guy. It's funny. Uh, somebody says, um, I agree. I'm a certified golf instructor with degrees in learning, education, and coaching. And uh, that's way more important than knowing how to run and market a pro shop. You got that right. Amen, brother. Yeah. Okay, guys. Thanks for watching. We're, we're going to sign off. Uh, I know that uh, a, a lot of you guys have hit the bell. The, if you saw this live video, if you're seeing this live, that means you probably hit the post notifications bell that is on YouTube. So click that, and that way you can be uh, notified. If you are not watching this live, click that, or if you are too, hit subscribe and click that post notifications bell. Tony, if you search Tony Lutzak Golf, on YouTube, you will see his channel. Subscribe to his channel. Um, Tony, you're going to be start posting more videos more often now, or, or you were telling me that you have a different approach coming up for videos. Well, let, I wouldn't say it's different. It's a little bit more in depth. I think the approach, and let me clarify, the approach isn't about the golf swing so much. We get more in depth on that. But I think the message I'm getting from inside the lab members and people that have gone to reactionarygolf.com is they have a lot of questions and that's helpful for me because for me, it's like, well, just do this and you're cured. Why are you worried about other things? But they're bringing all these questions in. Well, what about this? What about that? What about this? So the, once I get done, I got one more week of school, then I got a few exams and then cranking out a bunch of videos and kind of going in through this to help give them a guide on trying to organize this information that's out there about golf instruction. Should I do this? Should I do that? Well, here's some benefits possibly to that. And here's some negatives, you know? So that's what, that's, what's going to be coming up in the month of December, cranking out some videos. Awesome. And people have asked because I see as part of what I do on the channel, I see a lot of different coaches uh, all over the country and uh, a lot of uh, talk to a lot of coaches as well through email and everything else. But, uh, Personally, for my golf swing and for me trying to get better, uh, Tony's my instructor. So I really look forward to uh, you guys coming out and joining Tony and I and working together in Las Vegas. And also, uh, maybe we might be doing something in spring break again. So um, go to reactionarygolf.com. Tony's going to have some stuff about it there. Also, go to bebettergolf.net slash school, and you'll hear about the uh, Las Vegas school coming up. Thanks for the time, Tony. I really enjoyed it. Oh, did we, do, did we yeah. fix golf? Is golf going to be all better now? <laughs> did we come up with any solutions at all? Um, solutions? Uh, probably not. Just if you want to learn the game, 
find somebody, find some good information that actually makes you better. You know, it's about like with the name of And it shouldn't show. take, excuse me, but it should, because like, a lot of people stick with a guy and, you know, it's a long, how long should it take to be like, okay, I'm hitting the ball better? Like lesson one, lesson 10? Uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Oh, okay. That's my standard. If it takes longer than 20 minutes and you're not hitting the ball, one or two shots, you know, contact, oh, I'm getting it. It doesn't mean you've learned it. You know, you've developed it. It just means you've learned something. You should be able to get the concept down on what a good swing feels like in, in t under 20 minutes. Okay, guys, thanks for watching. Uh, I think the solutions that we call with marketing should be different. It should be more of a bottom-up rather than a top-down approach, you know, really localization, hardcore localization of what does this market need and, and interact with the people who know. And uh, something does have to change equipment-wise, I think, uh, ball-wise, and uh, just make it more fun for people by getting better. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you later. Yeah.